Well, hello, Nathan. Welcome to Rendering Unconscious. I'm so happy to have you here. Uh, thank you very much. I'm really excited to be here. And we get to talk all about your fabulous new book and the fabulous conference you're organizing. Where should we start? Uh, let's start with the book. Okay. How did this uh, book come called, into uh, being? Yeah, it's called uh, The Unwritten Enlightenment, Literature Between Ideology and the Unconscious. Uh, it came into being, well, it's been a long journey. It started out as... Uh, part of my dissertation research more than a decade ago, but it's in, it's since undergone a lot of transformation. It's been completely rewritten and rethought several times between then and now. It took me a while to figure out the questions that I was really asking and what I really wanted to know. So what, um, what uh, interested me was the at first, the origin of psychoanalysis and the origin of the unconscious. Um, in a lot of my other writings, I've referred to psychoanalysis as what I call the most human of the human sciences, in part because uh, psychoanalysis is animated, to my mind, by the question, what makes us who we are, not only as a species or together as a a society or a culture or a civilization, um, not even simply as individuals, but more importantly, as, as subjects. And uh, so I think psychoanalysis is the science of the experience of being a subject, uh, you know, beyond our, our so-called individuality, beyond what we can know about ourselves, what we can name, what we're supposed to be. And so the more I looked into the origins of this science, um, in, into the conditions of what we sometimes call the Freudian discovery, the more I found how thoroughly indebted this discovery was to a larger history of science, a history of ideas that came together around the 18th century and that today calls itself the Enlightenment. So I wanted to know what is going on with the unconscious and the enlightenment in its most generally stated terms. Uh, and once I begin digging in that direction, I was really surprised and excited about what I found. What did you find? Tell me more. <laughs> um, well, okay. Uh, first, let's, let's speak historically about this. If the history of ideas that came together around the 18th century and calls itself the Enlightenment was also the origin or the condition for the Freudian discovery, this would naturally suggest that the unconscious or the phenomena that Freud would gather under the heading of the unconscious didn't just uh, like erupt into existence at the turn of the 20th century, um, that there must be something of the subject of the unconscious, that's a Lacanian phrasing, at least as early as the so-called enlightenment. So uh, the book then would be a kind of a test. Um, everything about the enlightenment, even the name enlightenment, would suggest a kind of an allergy to the unconscious. Uh, but what is it exactly that, that agitates this idea of enlightenment so much that it could induce such a, a reaction? an allergic reaction. Um, is the subject of the unconscious at work or at stake even here where the modern terms and conditions for scientific objectivity were established, where individuality and individualism were considered the pinnacle of rationality and the subject of the Enlightenment was formulated as a subject of reason? And what I found is that the unconscious, as Freud would later define it, was an accidental invention of the Enlightenment. In other words, that this unconscious is not a rational formulation, but a, a strangeness which is internal to rationality itself, internal to the historical development of the very idea of rationality in the modern age. Um, and this accidental invention, the unconscious, it acts upon and it undermines the presumed sovereignty or autonomy of the subject of reason, um, the subject of rationality 
from within the, the fortress of reason uh, on the Enlightenment's own terms. And I mean that literally in that the, the unconscious emerges in my reading in the very works of literature um, that helped formalize and popularize some of its most adoring, enduring assumptions and beliefs. Uh, and in particular, I'm looking at novels and novelistic discourse because this is where the literary innovations and experimentalism of the 18th century really joined narrativity and identity in a, a formative and formally interesting, uh, I would say, historically um, and aesthetically essential way. So I ended up writing the book in order to configure this triangle connecting literature, the Enlightenment, and the unconscious, and to show how unconscious fantasy springs up in the most surprising places. And, and because these surprises can, I think, be far more subversive than any straightforward critique of the Enlightenment that, that doesn't account for the ways it can recon reconstitute itself or, or recuperate its own critique, I think there is a real politics of fantasy or a politics of the unconscious at work uh, and at stake here. And what kind of novels? Uh, well, I am reading some of the most enduring and important works of 18th century literature. They are sometimes referred to as novels, depending on who you ask. I use the overarching term novels and novelistic discourse because they are novel experiments in the question, what can a human being be after history has exhausted itself, after we have reached the limits of what an unwelcome inheritance can force upon us. In the Enlightenment, this has to do, uh, according to certain interpretations of the idea of Enlightenment, with theocracy or with religion or with superstition um, or with dogma, uh, with authoritarianism. And uh, uh, so the, 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 the notion of, like the, the, the genre of the novel really is only codified as a genre throughout the history of the 18th century. But I'm working with some texts that I think belong within that history of experimentation. The first of them is Robinson Crusoe, which is second only to the Bible, I believe, in uh, the number of editions in English that have been published. Uh, and I read Robinson Crusoe, which everybody thinks they know, is the story of a shipwrecked sailor trying to survive with the scraps and remnants of a world he's left behind. I read that as, in fact, a correlate or a, um, a structurally consistent with the form of a psychotic delusion. So I'm reading Robinson Crusoe alongside Daniel Paul Schraber's Memoirs of My Nervous Illness in order to uh, show how this emblem of instrumental rationality, the uh, foundational myth of the modern self-made man is the story of a psychosis. And I don't do that in order to pathologize psychosis or to imagine somehow that we therefore can exist outside of above or beyond the delusion that is called the enlightenment, but in order to realign the uh, ethical and critical sensibilities that we bring to our indictments of some of the worst excesses of enlightenment, colonialism, racism, anti-blackness, and so on. In essence, we can't simply stand or pretend that we stand outside of the enlightenment and pass judgment on it from some superior vantage, some position of a greater knowledge. We have to rethink what it means to problematize the structure of the delusion from within. The next chapter brings Jean-Jacques Rousseau, in particular his education theory, into a surprising conversation, maybe a confrontation with the Marquis de Sade, who we wouldn't normally think of as a kind of pedagogue, but by his own account, the value of Sade's writing was in its pedagogical functions and what it could teach us about learning itself. So, and moreover, Sade really wanted to fashion himself after Rousseau, whom he thought of as a kind of personal hero. And 
uh, the argument there essentially is that the Marquis de Sade discovers a certain annihilatory logic in Rousseau's pedagogy, that Rousseau's ideal program for the education of a modern rational subject would involve uh, involves a kind of uh, uh, a journey of self cancellation that I am suggesting is a correlate of what Freud would call the death drive. Saad discovers this and takes Rousseau beyond himself and develops the logical conclusion of a pedagogy of the death drive, which is not pretty. In fact, it's quite grotesque, but it nevertheless, or precisely because of that grotesquery, gives form to a certain desire for the impossible, an impossible freedom that would be a freedom of desire, which is more radical than the more liberal and eventually neoliberal conception of freedom that the traditional quote unquote enlightenment wants to imagine. And then the last major reading is about Lawrence Stern's Tristram Shandy, which is an impossible book. I, I don't know, have you, have you read Tristram Shandy? Yeah, but like 20 years ago, so. <laughs> yeah, well, you could read it twenty times in a year, and and still it, you'd find it, um, you know, just as rewarding and just as maddening. So uh, what I'm in, what I'm interested in with Tristram Shandy, and this is really where my theory of the unwritten reaches its its apex, is how it really is the formalization, the uh, the formalization of a certain aesthetics of the drive. It is an exercise in sublimation, uh, which uh, feels like, because it is, an experience of sexual frustration. It's an experience of sexual frustration because the way it is operating language, the way it's making use of signification, is such that it draws out the fact that the more we try to get at what we mean, the more we try to say on the way to some truth, the more inevitably the proliferation of possibilities of meaning something else develops. So the more we reach after what's real, the more it seems to escape us. And I'm reading this as a... Um, a kind of early literary figuration of what much later on in the 20th century, Lacan will try himself to formalize through the logic of sexual difference that we have on one hand with Tristram's characters, a figuration, a figuration, an emblematization of a certain masculine jouissance of sort of phallic signifying and always saying more and more and more in order to come to the point. And at the same time, this sort of explosion of anxiety around the impotence involved in precisely that gesture. And that there is therefore in the enjoyment of trying and failing to get to the point an enjoyment of that very failure that Lacan will call other jouissance and that he will align with the feminine side of the formulas of sexuation. So in this book, which is a series of conversations between men about men where women are for the most part uh, explicitly excluded from the conversation and where even in a broader historical sense, Stern took up some of the strategies of sentimental literary representation that women writers at the time were using and ran with them, essentially stole the form from the women of the time that even or especially in this seemingly most masculine of texts, there is a uh, confounding of masculinity and not simply a kind of recurrence of some sort of eternal feminine, but an undoing of the supposed stability or the very difference between man and woman that really corresponds to and confirms almost 300 years ago, some of the more contemporary scholarship on uh, psychoanalysis and sexual difference, uh, even from the last couple of years. So there is, once again, at the core of 
a seemingly conservative exercise of Enlightenment authority, a strange and surprising subversion. Very interesting. Well, I wish I would have been able to read more of it, uh, but it just came a couple of days ago. So I've only had it for a couple of days, but you've definitely whet my appetite and I can't wait to dive into this book. Thanks. I can't wait to hear what else you might uh, think about it, particularly because I would like for it to be not, it's not just an academic exercise. I would really like for this to be a text that appeals to clinicians in psychoanalytic practice. In what way? Well, um, first of all, I think uh, psychoanalysis can be conceived of, among other things, or in among other ways, as a certain ethics of reading that recognizes reading as a practice and an active or a creative endeavor. It recognizes that interpretation is a way of making meaning rather than simply discovering it. And I think this is a sensibility that in many ways precedes psychoanalysis and can help orient its practice today. In fact, I think that the ethics of literary criticism that develops out of and in response to the Enlightenment at the end of the 18th and beginning of the 19th century is the other historical precedent or foundation for the Freudian discovery. So uh, the there's a historical argument to be made there. There's also an argument to be made about the importance of literature to psychoanalytic, psychoanalytic practice, mm -hmm. discourse, theory, and experience from the very beginning. Mm -hmm. So we think about, you know, immediately we think about Oedipus, but also Hamlet, or we think of uh, Jensen's Gradiva, or with um, Lacan with the, you know, uh, Racine and uh, Saad and a number of other, I mean, there, there's just, literature is an essential touchstone for the articulation of psychoanalytic knowledge, in part because the sort of truth that literature aims at is not a factual truth. It's a truth which is both more and less than fact. And so the strategies of reading that I'm proposing and the ethics of reading that I'm attempting to develop here, I'm doing in conversation with some of those touchstones in the history of psychoanalytic thought in ways that I hope will um, also clarify what's at stake in clinical practice. Um, and of course, it goes the other way around. I want the clinic to be informing what goes on with critical psychoanalysis. For too long, I think, and for and, and too often, and I'm not saying this is always the case, but it is often the case that when literature and psychoanalysis are put in a room together, one of them ends up working for the other. There is a kind of not so much a relation as an instrumentalization of one by the other. Psychoanalysis uses literature as illustration or uh, figuration. Literature uses psychoanalysis as a set of concepts that can be pulled out of their clinical context without any regard for their clinical stakes, without any regard for the fact that this is, as I've said, the most human of the human sciences, and apply them to liter literature as one applies paint to a fence. So I am really entreating readers to rethink this relationship or the possibility of a relation in ways that both acknowledge the similarities, the commonalities, even to an extent the identities between the two of them, while also acknowledging and respecting the differences. Because it is within and across those differences that a relation, really that any relation becomes possible. There is uh, no relation without difference. And so I'm trying to think both sides of that divide in order to both hold them apart and bring them together. Wonderful. And now should we talk about the conference? Okay, yes, thank you. I'm so excited for this conference and to come to New York. Yeah, you're participating in the conference. <laughs> Tell us all about it. What are we doing? <laughs> <laughs> uh, this is an international symposium centered around the... Auto Rank Archives, which are housed at Columbia's Rare Book and Manuscript Library. 
this is something like 47 packed boxes full of materials belonging to one of the most formative and important characters from within Freud's inner circle. Uh, Ronk and Freud were good friends. Freud was uh, a patron of his, uh, a mentor of his, and uh, Ronk was an important member of the International Psychoanalytic Association in its early days. And so the archive includes numerous personal correspondences between them, postcards uh, Freud sent to him uh, while on vacation, uncorrected proofs, uh, minutes from Wednesday society meetings, um, and a whole host of other materials, really a, a priceless treasure trove of information there. Well, in 1924, so 100 years ago, almost to the day, Ronk published an important book called The Trauma of Birth, which was the first major work from within Freud's inner circle to suggest the primacy of the maternal body to the formation of the unconscious as opposed to the father and the Oedipus complex. Now, Ronk tried to prevaricate here, but ultimately uh, this was received by some of his one-time colleagues turned enemies and a kind of sibling rivalry, people like Ernest Jones and Carl Abraham, uh, as a, sort of an assault on the fundamental principles of psychoanalysis. Uh, Ronk was also personally offended that Freud didn't agree with him, even though Freud did try to insist among the rabble on the importance of making one's own way, of publishing one's own ideas without waiting for approval from the so-called master. Uh, and eventually this led to a terrible falling out between Ronk and the rest of the IPA. He was essentially exiled. He lived the rest of his days uh, largely in New York or in Paris and uh, turned his back on psychoanalysis and developed against the whole Freudian field in a way that nevertheless resonates with a lot of its core uh, interventions a form of psychotherapy he called will therapy, which was based on his reading of Nietzsche and his theory of personality types, according to which the highest, most actualized personality is that of the artist. That in essence, we can be cured of our neuroses by channeling our neurotic energies in the direction of aesthetic creation. Um, so uh, because of that rupture, and because of the eccentricity, relatively speaking, in relation to the rest of the surrounding history of Ronk's ideas, his own will therapy has been in many ways largely forgotten. And he's remembered today, I think, more than anywhere else for being at the center of Freud's essay on the uncanny, which is one of the most widely read, widely taught essays in the whole of the Freudian oeuvre. There he draws directly and explicitly from Franck's theory of the double or the doppelganger in order to develop his theory of the uncanny. And so here in 2024, we're bringing both of these facts together, the 100 year anniversary of the trauma of the publication of the trauma of birth for Ronk, for Freud and for all of psychoanalysis. And the uh, remnants of Ronk, which still seem to haunt the psychoanalytic archive under the heading of Ronk Horror. I suppose you could interpret it or pronounce it as Rank Horror. And we're bringing folks from all over the world, really, to consider how Ronk's legacy continues to reverberate in more or less disturbing ways throughout psychoanalysis its history and its present. Yeah, one of the things I really loved about your call for papers was how diverse it was and how you mentioned, you know, not just Freud and Lacan, but like all sorts of different strains of psychoanalysis, including transpersonal psychoanalysis and, and uh, Stanislav Graf. So it, it really, I'm, I'm sure, is going to be an amazing collection of individuals. Yeah, I'm sure as well. And um, yeah, I'm glad you brought up this, this transpersonal psychology issue. Another branch of my contemporary research, now that I've completed the book, involves a long-standing and still-developing project on the, the 
history and the possibility of the future of a relation between psychoanalysis and psychedelics. And Stanislav Grof was one of the, is one of the um, founding figures in the development of a psychedelic, what he calls a psycholytic psychotherapy after Freud. By his own account, he was working for the Sandoz Corporation while they were developing their experiments with LSD in the middle of the 20th century and found after doing enough acid himself that he held within him a very powerful and vivid memory of his own birth that the Freudian paradigm was simply incapable of handling. And so he decided that it was necessary to turn away from psychoanalysis and to to travel someplace else. So there the trauma of birth really has, I'm not sure that Groff ever cites Ronk directly, maybe he does, but it has. It does. Okay, there you go. <laughs> it has a direct bearing um, on the development of the, this, this troubled and still troubling relation between, or difference or antagonism between psychoanalysis and psychedelics. It sounds like you've done some research in this direction yourself. Yeah, I've read a lot of Groff, and uh, he just actually came out with a, a pair of books last year, uh, like in November, called The Way of the Psychonaut, and it basically summarizes, I guess, like some sort of group or something asked him to teach a course on kind of the breadth of his writing and research over the years. And so he developed this course where he like taught basically what he found from each one of his books along the way and summarized each each text and then also like added to it or, or changed things based on what he thinks now versus what when he wrote the original works. And then he basically took that class and turned it into uh, two books. And um, it's fantastic. And he has a whole section on wrong. And he talks about oh. these like original psycho analysts like this original group and how you know the, there's all this like arguing between them but really the way he sees them is like they, they each have this like place in the kind of human drama and they're each talking about like a different piece of it which i thought was really interesting yeah fabulous i mean uh this is i mean the way of the psychonaut is a, a large two volume set that i'll need to dig into but this is exactly the sort of conversation that i'm excited to develop at the symposium. It's here in New York, May 8, 9, and 10, on May 8th at Barnard College. Um, we will be holding a keynote event with the New York Times bestselling author Stephen Graham Jones in conversation with School of the Arts, Columbia School of the Arts professor Victor Laval. And on the 9th and 10th, the more I almost say academic, but the clinical and critical conversation of which you and I will be a part will take place on the fifth floor of the Butler Library on Columbia's campus. And these events, by the way, are, are free and open to the public. Um, we'll have to require registration in advance, but anybody who is interested should look out for publicity or um, you can reach out to me via my um, email address at... Uh, at Barnard. And what's the best way to register? Well, we will have um, a, a electronic registration available um, in, in the next couple of weeks. Yeah, so as soon as that's up, then I'll put this episode up so that way I can link to it for oh, everybody so they can fantastic. easily find it. Right. So you'll just, uh, they'll just, people will just be able to check in the, co in the comments below. Yeah. All right, great. Okay in the show notes, as I call them, <laughs> or at renderingunconscious.org, because I, I create a special page for every episode where it has links to everything we talk about so people can easily sign up for things or buy books, for example, like the yeah, I'm, Enlightenment. <laughs> I've explored these, um, yeah, these pages, uh, these episode pages, very helpful resource. I really, I really appreciate all the work you do for the Freudian cause of Vanessa. It's really, and you're really an invaluable resource and and real, real champion for the unconscious. At this point, it's compulsive. <laughs> <laughs> I can't, can't stop myself it. if I tried. <laughs> I guess it's probably a good problem to have. Well, I'm, <laughs> depending on how long your days are.
it snowballs it snowballs it just keeps growing no i love it i mean it's the best way when you move to a different country you know you don't mm -hmm. you don't have any community anymore i don't have any community anymore in the same way and when i was mm -hmm. in new york you know there's so many psychoanalytic institutes and happenings and then we had dust and Bahagan, and we were throwing events like every week and you know getting to talk to different scholars and clinicians and analysts and you know people from all different psychoanalytic theoretical orientations and it was great to have this kind of discussion between like the Kleinians, Lacanians, Freudians, you know, relational, you know, it was, it was wonderful, but New York's so rich. And I, of course, knew it wasn't like that everywhere because I'm from Miami and it's definitely not like that in Miami. <laughs> um, so, so I knew it was special, but then I didn't realize quite how special it really is to have so much psychoanalysis, like so accessible and in so many different ways of thinking. Mm -hmm. um, so it's just been a way to kind of continue that and be able to continue to have community and talk to different theorists and people from all over the place now. Now it's like from everywhere around the world. It's really wonderful. Yeah, it's um, it's really been a transformative experience for me moving back to New York. I, I moved here after spending several years out in Salt Lake City. And while I was able to continue participating particularly in academic psychoanalytic conversations at conferences and so on it was only once i came back here that i really that i could really understand just how diverse and expansive contemporary psychoanalysis is so uh there's you know there's freud there's lacan increasingly there's an interest in laplanche and that doesn't exhaust but you know academic psychoanalysis but where i come from in comparative literature those are the dominant names but out here in New York, you've got Kleinians, you've got a real, you've got a, a large community around Wilfred Dion, which is mm -hmm. incredible to me. And in, in, mm -hmm. yeah, in, in, in good ways. I, um, I continue to meet people from a variety of different psychoanalytic institutes. And I, there, I mean, not only is it unique among American cities, but I think I'd be willing to venture that it's unique worldwide in terms of the, the the quantity, the quality, the diversity of psychoanalysis here. Yeah, I would say so too, because I talk to a lot of different people and usually if there is a thriving scene, it's usually kind of one, which usually the people I talk to are Lacanian, <laughs> mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. um, but it, it is really so diverse. And even like the, there's like two Jungian institutes, you know, it's like you have so yeah. many different institutes and and multiple of each, you know. Mm -hmm. amazing and i don't get the sense not really not among the people that i've hung out with that the narcissism of small differences is particularly operative here i think everybody i don't know i can't say everybody but a lot of people are um happy to indulge those differences and even to engage in spirited debate across those differences and so there's a there's an intellectual vibrancy to it as well. And that's one of the reasons I'm really excited about having this symposium here in New York, because I can draw from a variety of representatives of these different pockets of the psychoanalytic community here to, I think, invent a new conversation about around Otto Rock. So, you know, he has enjoyed some small degree of, of critical and largely historical interest over the last a uh, few decades, but I'm trying to bring together folks who maybe don't have a whole lot of prior knowledge of Rock and his relation to Freud and to psychoanalysis to see what else we can do by returning to that archive. Wonderful. And should we mention a few of the other speakers and presenters that are going to be there? Like yeah, there are a few. Uh, there are, We've got a, a great lineup of speakers. Um, Leon Brenner from Berlin, Bostian Nadeau from Ljubljana, Stephen Miller from Buffalo, and Fernando Negrete from Buffalo as well. Uh, yourself, Vanessa. Um, Jameson Webster from here in New York. And... Um, Seth Brodsky from Chicago, who's a wonderful um, musicologist um, and a really, really smart Lacanian doing interest or uh, smart thinker of psychoanalysis, doing interesting things uh, with sound. And um, yeah, I feel like that's that's it. I should just double check. I, it's been, as you might imagine, a long day for me as well. <laughs> um 
No, it's great. That'll be fun. I didn't know Jameson was going to be there. I had to write her. I've been, Jameson and I have been friends since high school. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so that'll be fun. Yeah, Jameson's been doing some interesting work on breath and breathing lately. And from what I understand, is going to incorporate some of that thinking into some remarks on rock. Uh, and I'm still gathering abstracts and titles from some of the other participants. But I know that we will have a real... Um, you know, a range and a diversity of presentations. We also are hosting a screening of the short film um, White Devil by Mariama Diallo and Ben Dickinson uh, here at Columbia on the evening of May 9th, along with the discussion that Jameson has agreed to um, to moderate. So we have uh, we also have an exhibit uh, featuring a lot of the some really remarkable materials from the Ronk archives and from tangentially related archives at the Rare Book and Manuscript Library Reading Room. And so it's uh, going to be a multimodal, multimedia, multinational event. Fantastic. Is there anything else that you wanted to mention that we didn't get to yet? Anything else you're working on or anything else coming up? A conference is enough, but... <laughs> Yeah, that's a lot. I'm always working on something. You know, I've got um, some other uh, research projects in the works. I'm continuing to develop my work on psychedelics and psychoanalysis. I was very pleased to be included in the most recent issue of Parapraxis with an article called Psychoanalysis on Drugs, which um, is, um, I think it's kind of, it, it, I'm, I'm endlessly fascinated by this topic. And even in 6,000 words, which might be a little long, could only really scratch the surface of a really peculiar, fascinating, sometimes hilarious and sometimes tragic story about psychedelics in particular, but drugs in general in the Freudian field. So I will, you know, hopefully be able to sit down with you again once I've got some more so I've got another bigger publication on that subject uh, in front of me. Oh, yeah, that would be great. And let's yeah. talk about parapraxis. What amazing work is happening over at parapraxis. Yeah, yeah, I'm I'm really impressed with them. And working with them on this article, I mean, they're so thorough, thorough and so thoughtful. The editorial feedback they gave me from the first draft to the last was very generous, very generative. They're incredibly professional and really smart, and they've made me a better writer, not just when it comes to that article, uh, but I think in general. Um, so I worked closely with Michelle Rada, and she's uh, wonderful. Um, Hannah Zabin, also fantastic. And, uh, you know, I'm really uh, pleased and honored to be a part of a project that I think is doing really important work to not just revive, but to represent a broader revival with a newer generation of interest in the unconscious in all its surprising forms. And it's, you know, it looks really amazing. I mean, the design, of, yeah, every issue is an object of art. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, and as far as psychedelics, have you talked to Richard Boothby? Because I saw Richard Boothby give a fantastic talk um, for this like psycho. This is a there's someone in England who I interviewed for the podcast um, who ended up having Richard on at like a psycho psycho uh, psychedelic society in England. And yeah, it's Timmy Davis, right? I was yeah, I was a part of that. I was part of that symposium. Um, well, there you go then. A couple of years ago. Yeah. I haven't <laughs> talked to Rick about um, psychedelics. Um, I haven't seen him in a little while. Last we spoke, he was, we were talking about um, anxiety. Yeah. Anxiety. <laughs> Which is death. obviously, yeah, yeah, yeah obviously. But psychedelics can help with that. Yeah. I'm going to have to reach out to him about that. It's a, it's a great tip. And I think that, you know, other people, uh, it's it's starting to catch on as of course it inevitably would because psychedelics are increasingly back on the main stage in not just popular culture where they kind of never left even if the roar died down a little bit but in a kind of corporatized medicalized psychopharmacological context and that's something that really should concern psychoanalysis and that we have um 
an opportunity and I would say probably an ethical obligation to deal with. So I'm glad to know about uh, every time anybody else is is um, exploring this really interesting subfield. I think it's really exciting and important. Yeah, absolutely. And I also just recently had someone on the podcast named Julian Vane. He's more of like an occultist, magical practitioner, but he does a lot of research on psychedelics as well in England. And he, he has some really interesting things to say about it as well, too. So check that episode out. Julian. Yeah, Vane. I will. Thank it you. It was just a couple episodes ago. Julian Vane. Got it. Yeah. Um, yeah, I am interested because of this topic in the question of mysticism um, and in what Freud, I think, wanted to call or tried to develop as a kind of science of mysticism, because that too is enjoying a contemporary resurgence. So that, for instance, in the study of the um, potentially medicinal mental health properties of psilocybin mushrooms coming out of Johns Hopkins University, for instance. Uh, one of the means they have of examining what is a, a necessarily deeply subjective experience among their participants is what they call the mystical experiences questionnaire, where you can, you know, rate your, you know, your sense of oneness on a scale of I suppose one <laughs> to, <laughs> to five. So so anyway, the 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 question of mystical experience and the question of psychedelic experience have always been closely entwined, or at least as long as there's been some, the, something like a concept of psychedelics. Um, and again, um, psychoanalysis has been there from the beginning. In fact, a big part of the the, the breakdown between Rock and Freud also circulates around this this science of mystical experience where there was um you know a controversy over whether mysticism was an effect of a kind of boundless narcissism or whether it was a kind of unresolved kernel of longing for um, a kind of protective father figure that freud saw at the foundation of religion um or whether it had to do with um fantasies of, of being back in the womb and therefore uh, fantasies of overcoming the trauma of birth. So, you know, it's a, it's a rich tapestry with a lot of, um, a lot of interesting veins of, of inquiry that I'm also excited to continue to develop. And I'll check out this Julian Bain episode. Thank you for the hot tip. Yeah, it was really interesting. Well, it's been so nice to have you on, Nathan. I know that you have to go. Um, but I get to see you in New York in about a month, a little over a month. So yeah, it's going to be fun. Well, thanks again, Vanessa. It's been a pleasure uh, speaking with you. I, re I really appreciate all your, your questions and your kind support. I'll look forward to seeing you soon uh, as well. Be in touch. Okay. Thanks again. Bye. Bye.